This is the NeoBox call for Monday, May 6th, 2025. Go right ahead wherever you're going to go. Oh, I was just, I was just going to say it's been uh, a crazy, uh, crazy couple of weeks for me. Um, we've really started uh, some of the work that we've been planning for some months. And so, which is interesting because it, it's somewhat informed by our conversations here, which is good. Awesome. Love that. Um, any particular parts you want to check in on that, that makes sense to yeah. mention to me? Yeah. Please. Um, hey, Klaus. Um, so we've been working on uh, sort of big picture is collaboratives, a new type of organization. We've, we've called them radical companies in the past. Um, moving towards the idea of a collaborative, moving towards startups rather than transforming existing organizations. And um, also the um, this idea that uh, in order to do this, we, we need to change a lot of different ways of doing the same thing. Uh, one of which is um, agreements, contracts, practices, protocols is what we're starting to to use. So we're building our protocols and it's an open source protocol model that we're developing. And I'm realizing as we're working on it that it's it's essentially the same thing. And I think that's why I've been seeing it in the way that I've been seeing it. Um, that essentially what I, I've kind of this weekend, it sort of hit on me um, that what we're looking for is, I think, this is what came to me, that what we're looking for is is a collective understanding of some kind. like, right. And it's not always the same, and it's always messy, and it's all of that stuff. But that's what we want, is a collective understanding. And that that what we've been describing in Neobooks is this ability to build a collective understanding yep. um, and yep. and with protocols um, so our protocols is this idea that um, are, are you at all familiar with with uh, package management tools from software like npm oh, very, or something very, like, that? Like, like like docker and all that or uh, you don't mean the, you don't mean no. the coding side you mean the project no the library side. the library side okay a little so, bit. Only so, so the idea, for those of you who don't know, uh, the idea is that we build libraries. Libraries are pieces of software that you can build together, compose together, and turn into your own software. And most software today is like 80 to 90% libraries and 10 to 20% your own code. Like if you look at the actual amount of code that it makes your application work, sometimes like 95% of it is libraries and 5% is, is uh, this. And so different uh, software, different languages have their own package managers, which essentially is like a, a place where you can see all these libraries and you can find them and you can discover them, install them into your own application. So I started thinking that uh, in the case of our protocols, that really what we're talking about is a package management where you can find the different protocols, discover them, find them, repurpose them, use them. A sort of like a GitHub, which is where you store the packages that you've grabbed for yourself and, and sort of used, and then the ability to um, compose these things into your own, uh, um, your own business needs or, or personal needs, whatever the case may be. And so the idea is that rather than going out and writing a contract from scratch, asking a lawyer to write a contract, that you go to this protocol package manager, and uh, it's a really exciting thing, obviously. That's and, great. Um, and you find the different protocols for the different things you wanted in your contract. 
And these protocols are pre-existing protocols uh, for a specific category there, just like in the, in the software development game, there's 10 libraries, right? And those libraries are being improved over time. So they have different versions. And so you end up with, you choose the protocol that serves your needs. You choose the version, probably the latest one, but maybe there's a different version than the one that somebody's tweaked. And then you choose that and you adopt that version of the protocol for yourself. Uh, but then you ask your colleagues to do the same. So they too can then look at the library. They too can then decide on one. And then you guys negotiate. Yeah, yeah, this is the best one. Let's pick that. And now you've what you do is you say, that's the agreement that we have. These protocols that we've just agreed on. And so essentially your agreement is a stack of protocols that define what you want to do with maybe a little wrapper on it that that 10 percent that says you know we're going to do this and this and this and this and these are the protocols that meet these needs and here's our protocols boom, 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 boom. and we'll update them and everybody feels comfortable going in and updating that protocol so this weekend i was thinking about about Neobooks, because I've been working on the protocols work, I started to realize that maybe it's not all that different. That maybe we're talking about the same thing, but instead of protocols, what we have is understandings. And so I thought I'd throw that out and see what you guys think of it. I'm hearing shouting from downstairs because my wife just finished a webinar that was delayed like an hour because they were having audio trouble. So I expect an interruption in a moment because she's very happy right now. Um, <laughs> I, I totally, totally agree with you. Um, and it's interesting to think, I hadn't thought about NeoBooks in the contract environment, for example, and it would be like, hey, give me the, the latest IP module we have. And you might even have like slider bars that are like, give me the hard ass IP, IP settings, mo latest module or give me the most lenient author-friendly IP settings uh, uh, module or cluster or subset or nuggets or whatever. And then you, you compile them up and then you add some original material for this particular context or to name the parties in this asset and in this, in this uh, agreement, this contract, and you're off, on, off to the races. So that makes a lot of sense to me. And, and, and I think key to both visions are the ever improving nuggets that that we're a community of people trying to make these things better over time and that that's important <clears throat> and so it, it's the it's the action of refinement or improvement or refactoring or whatever the right word there is and the composability of the objects that allows this even to happen mm -hmm. in some way so exactly <clears throat> so love that makes total sense to me yeah i would uh... <laughs> I would also just chime in on this. <clears throat> the, the biggest challenge really is to have a commonly agreed platform to work with. So right now, of course, in, in my food and agriculture bucket, the farm bill is on the docket. You know, and the discussions around the farm bill are uh, getting getting really intense because there are literally billions of dollars at stake. And the incentive systems inherent in this drive, you know, the way the system functions, and there is what, what the what the neo book does in in these nuggets. It's it provides single snapshots of things that uh, everybody agrees with, right? I mean, so for example, I, I wrote. I mean, through through the with the AI, I wrote one paper on uh, the link between the nutrient uh, the value of soil with the nutrient value and density of crops coming out of that soil. And, and I posted that and, and uh, with the Bionutrient Food Association and you know, a, a guy I know from, from on the board there and, and a, another group of people. And now, um, uh, I mean, I could have never written this by myself. You know, the, 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 what this AI generated there was, was you know, amazingly complex. But um, 
it, it actually redirected the efforts of the Bionutrient Food Association, where they're now saying that like organic or regenerative doesn't automatically result in nutrient dense. So nutrient density is completely aligned with soil the microbial quality. And that changes the nature of the research they're doing. Um, and it changes the nature of direction that you give to farmers and the incentive systems to farmers creates a simplification, right? Because now let's just focus only on soil health and in a in a you know, farm the right way. And then also there's huge uh, dissension about meat markets, for example. You know, the, within the Sierra Club, for example, you have several groups that are basically fighting each other. You have uh, the uh, savory uh, rotational grazing. You know, let's take a billion acres of land, put millions of cattle on it, and they will they will rejuvenate uh, uh, the soil and grasslands and restore the hydrologic cycles. Well, then you have the wildlife protection, uh, biodiversity protection groups, the anti grazer groups, and they haven't talked with each other, right? The one thing, you know, and so, and that's just two groups. And so, so, so you have silos, you know, uh, in, of, of knowledge that, that are in, 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 and by themselves, they're all right, yeah. but they're just not connecting. Yeah. You know? And in the process of connecting, you, you have to make uh, adaptations and adjustments. And this connection process is very slow, painful, you know, difficult to get to. Um, but what the what the neobook process does, you know, you have individual nuggets which in and by themselves are undisputed. You know, everybody agrees with this particular nugget. Yes, that that uh, seems to be true. But if it how how is it true? in relationship with and to, right? That's sort of the next step uh, coming up now. Um, and, and it's just amazing, but even within really well-meaning people within the um, nonprofit sectors and process, um, uh, even with everybody, you know, with their best intentions, it's incredibly difficult to get people on a common platform. Just from what you're saying, it'd be really interesting if over the course of normal discourse in some group where you're talking to small farmers or legislators or whatever, you could pick things you've sort of agreed with casually in conversation and say, hey, let's mark this as a place we agree. And, and then if you sort of looked over the fence into the field of nuggets, you'd be like, the nuggets would start turning green because those would be the ones where you've agreed on. And you'd start noticing that you agree on a lot of stuff, right? Um, and then you, then that would make it easier to come to agreement and compose a document or, or, uh, multiple documents or whatever else. But, but it'd be fun. It'd be fun to have the things you've agreed on be more visible, more present during casual conversation. It's amazingly difficult. I mean, the, I've been traveling with the Kiss the Ground group now. I mean, I started when they first came out with their film, I did a couple of webinars with their with their creative lead in opinion uh, and got them into here's the legislative process pay attention to this and so on so I'm really uh, uh, very fond of this group right with, with what they're doing but their position but now I'm coming in let's get a campaign going for people to eat less meat let let's let's feature a plant forward flexitarian form of menu and engage with the public so people understand why this is a good idea for your personal health, for the environmental health, for animal health, and so on and so on. And, and all of a sudden, you know, they, they, they just can't get there because now we need to eat more meat. And so, so how does that work? Well, we need to get animals on grassland, and then we need to eat you know, more meat so that there is more incentive to put animals on grassland. And I said, well, how do you get from here to there? Right? I mean, how is this transition working in your mind? First of all, you're going to have endless litigation, you know, to open up public lands for grazing because you're displacing wildlife, you know, and 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 groups that are passionately. I almost got kicked out of a meeting here in Oregon with the uh, uh, wildlife reservation. I mean, I was suggesting to put some 
rotational grazing out there, and it's just yeah, we think you need to leave, kind of thing. You know, so okay. Wow. But but the so so you have these passionate opinions, but you can't. You know, I, I put out a uh, some charts of how much meat we're eating and where this is trending and the mathematical impossibility of continuing current trend lines, and you just can't get around it. So then, you know, go how how do we unstuck this you now? And and uh, um, I think that's really more the challenge. You know, start with nuggets, but then in the in the uh, connecting part, um, uh, it gets it gets it gets uh, difficult. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm also interested in the disagreement parts. Like you were saying earlier, Klaus, that th these are nuggets we all agree on. I think especially interesting nuggets are the ones where, well, no, there's it's contentious. And I'm on a mailing list where uh, um, Amory Lovins is doing battle with. Uh, uh, Carl Page, uh, who is um, the brother of the page that founded Google. And and Carl is like, you need to have nuclear. And Amory is like, nope, no nukes anywhere. Nukes are terrible fundamentally for, for a whole variety of reasons. And it's it's fascinating, but it's on a freaking private mailing list. So the information is not public. It drifts off into, there'll be one long burst email in the middle of a really long thread that I lose over time. Every now and then I copy them and paste them into my brain and mark them private so that they don't slip into the public. Uh, but so that I remember them and see them, see the arguments they made. And I would really love to see the arguments made far more tangibly um, so they could come out. And I think that, that, you know, animal grazing is one of these really contentious issues. It's like animals are great for the land. Animals are terrible for land. Uh, we need to make it more visible. I pasted a link for silvo pasture, which is like, well, you don't have to clear land for grazing. You can actually let the cows into the forest, and yeah, that works too. But I don't know. I'm not a I'm not a rancher. Yeah, the, the theories are all, are all, but but this is like in isolation. You know, the theory is right, but right now they're killing wolves all over the place because farmers who are grazing on public lands have an animal killed, and they want to shoot all the wolves, which then disrupts again the wildlife balance within this region yeah yep. so that's uh, just yeah uh, nature nature wants to eat its own as well um cool um does this inform us in any way about what we should add to what we're building i mean um let's say you've made a a, a strong argument for more structure in the way we're organizing nuggets or data um, um, I'm trying to figure out how to define metadata so that it lets you build that structure, but doesn't overcomplicate the nature of a nugget or overformalize its birth, which I mean, if you could only put a nugget into our shared space by labeling it with 15 different kinds of mandatory uh, tags and, and sort of uh, abstract ideas, that would really lessen people's uh, interest in or participation in probably creating material to share. But if but if other people wanted to tag up, if somebody if, if if somebody else wanted to come in and tag up my writings and enhance it with metadata, even if I disagreed with their enhancements, I'd be interested. And if they if I disagreed with their enhancements, their metadata, I might go in and you know add metadata of my own, which would then be one assumes more authoritative in some sense over the nuggets that I've created. Um, and I would be less authoritative in critiquing someone else's nuggets. But that how that all plays together is really fascinating to me. I think there is a break between putting out nuggets that build individual components of a, of a system, of a knowledge system, and then using these nuggets to arrive at conclusions. And 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 uh, and recommendations and ways forward, you know, because now each individual nugget has an opinion that needs that requires modification and adjustment and adaptation, and that process is very human, you know, it's very people centric, and and uh, and you and you you enter an emotional uh, sphere here that uh, that uh, makes things rather complicated. Well, a bunch of this stuff is highly emotional, if, if only because people have, some people have been in families that have been doing something some way generationally, like for, 
maybe even a couple hundred years, uh, you know, this is how we've done it. So why should we change, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, where do you see the break that you were just describing? Can you can you um, describe it a little bit more to us so I can understand better? Because for me, the life of a nugget that it might be sort of controversial that gets improved over time blends into the life of that particular nugget used in an argument or in some narrative thread. Those those seem to me to be pretty natural neighbors to each other, but you were describing a, a break between the two. Uh, so for example, I have one nugget, <clears throat> which is the uh, savory method of rotational grazing and grassland restoration. And I'm totally, everybody agrees with this. You know, that, 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 that just uh, absolutely makes sense. Then I have another nugget that says, um, forty percent of corn and sixty percent of soy, which is corn with GMO, chemically intensive, you know, polluting everything, destroying the soil, the ecosystem around it, the water tables, is used as animal feed in confined uh, animal uh, uh, feeding. So, yeah, and so, um, so that that requires a, so a resolution. Um, that short term is probably best served by reducing the demand for meat. Just take the pressure off the system uh, and then shift into regenerative where uh, Savory's method is one you know, uh, 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 potential, uh, but integrating farm animals into multi, multi crop farms you know, is another one. And so there are multiple solutions then. Well, mm -hmm. this bucket of Alan Savory refuses to yield. Right, mm -hmm. there we we need and 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 adamantly so. I mean, you know, and these are people who are influencers and they have you know, a large following. And and uh, I mean, the, the founder from Kiss the Ground is in this group, you know. So so they are really opinionated about this. You have met John Hulak, for example. He's normally a really reasonable mm -hmm. guy, but he is like you know, we need to eat more meat. And then you get into this debate and. I can't pull them out of the silo that they're in you know, without um, giving them, I guess, enough time and data points and so on so where they can like slowly advance to this because clearly they have never thought this through. You know, I mean, because my challenge was give me uh, a transition plan. How do you get from point A to point B here? You mm -hmm. know, where, how does that work? Well, they haven't thought about it. No, it's just this, even the new film that came out, you no know, Common Ground, you know, talks about here's what we should be doing. It doesn't at all mention how you're going to do this. You now, how does this work? What's the role of the general public you know, engaging in this transition, the political process, the economics that are involved here and so on? So this is where, where you have these touch points. You know. This is one of them. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Rick. Yeah, I'd just like to dovetail just on what you're saying, Klaus. I just can't imagine you being thrown out of a meeting, though. You're such a, a nice guy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I thought, wow, Klaus yeah. getting thrown out of a meeting. That must have been, you have to have it on YouTube or something. <laughs> <laughs> but what it does speak to is the sentiment and the power of belief systems. And I'm not going to belabor this point. I'll share something on it, but... Uh, this is where, um, you know, anybody can lo be locked into any metaphorical framework. And if you can't dislodge the metaphorical framework, whatever they're operating from, then nuggets may not cut the mustard. Uh, and this is where I'm more interested in how to create uh, complex questions that explores their worldview in a way that perhaps can merge towards what Jose was talking about earlier about collective intelligence. Because if, if there's no middle ground, you're polarized. So if you can't find the, uh, the fertile soil of middle ground, what may emerge from that? And that's the reason why I want to introduce the metaphor of acorns. That we, I, you know, I've said this before, and I know you guys are going to stay with your metaphor. That's fine, but you know, there there are metaphorical limitations to metaphors. So, I just want to add that, and I'll I'll I'll, I'll share you. Uh, I had fun with this blog post about donut economics, and this morning I woke up and I said, "Wow, all, all of these questions! I can have an individual visual image for each of them." 
And actually, I was quite impressed with what Dolly 3 was able to conjure up. So I'll put that blog post in there. So you can look at a series of visual images that are attached to particular questions. And so they're inquiry points of process rather than content um, focus nuggets. I mean, there can be different nuggets. You can make them any way you want. But uh, anyway, I would like to uh, introduce the idea of well, how do you play an acorn on middle ground in such a way that you can actually cross fertilize ideas if you want to play on that metaphorical framework. Anyway, I'll put the link in there and you can look at the visual images if you're so inspired. Thanks, Rick. Don't your complex questions or provocative questions rely on assertions about something? Um, not, they can, they can do, may not. Uh, it depends upon how they're framed. Um, I mean, they could have a basis on nuggets, so it's not explicit. I mean, I'll tell you what happened. I wrote this blog post. I listed all my objections to the donor economics on my okay. first draft, and they're all nuggets, all lots of nuggets, lots of nuggets from okay but then but then i said hey this isn't going to change the mindsets of people like what klaus because nuggets aren't going to change mindsets right so i i, I reframe them into questions and so i'm saying complex questions are acorns that might grow over time so anyway there you go thanks makes, i'll, I'll uh, put that I'll, I'll put that so into the Go ahead. Please do, please do. Yeah, put a link to the to the blog post in the chat. Um, and I and I uh, very explicitly agree with the idea that facts often don't change minds or opinions. In fact, often they solidify people's opinions. They just start refusing to participate. So there's a whole there's a whole extremely interesting question here about the dynamics of discourse and the dynamics of trying to convince people to shift behavior or shape behavior or do whatever else. I mean, Klaus, when you were talking earlier, I was thinking, oh yeah, and and one of the one of the problems worldwide is that when any community gets more prosperous, they want to eat more meat, right? Uh, they they become more carnivorous. It's like if everybody starts doing well economically, uh, meat meat production and consumption rates are likely to go up unless we change people's attitudes about it. Um, I posted sort of half in jest. There was an interesting article about the meat eater people out of the manosphere. The manosphere is like sort of to toxic masculine thing that Joe Rogan and others are busy promoting. Lex Friedman, Joe Rogan, and a bunch of other very popular bloggers are like, ah, oh, you should only eat meat. Like BBBE, uh, beef, butter, bacon, and eggs or something like that uh, is like the, the rudiments of this diet. I'm like, well, that sounds pretty unhealthy. Um, but also one of the problems in America is that uh, ve vegetarian food has so little inventiveness and variety that people don't really want to go there because you go to a restaurant and you look at the vegetarian you know options and they're not they're not that interesting. You go to India and you will never want to eat mm. meats because the vegetarian yeah, options exactly. are so delicious and so varied. Right? I, I, Chennai almost turned me into a vegetarian. Um, I was just entranced with the food and then didn't miss uh, meat you know animal products for a, for a moment. So there's so there's a lot of storytelling and relationship building that needs to happen for anybody to change their mind, I think. That that is maybe more important than a nugget that's full of a fact. But an, but remember that a nugget can also be a story. So the story of the man and his horse is a you know long long standing Chinese or otherwise philosophical story, um, which is a nugget, right? And and is not likely based in fact, it was likely invented by somebody, uh, but it's an argument for why sometimes when that bad things happen to you, it turns out that they're good things. Super. Yeah. The nugget that's sort of uh, bouncing around in my head for you know, a couple of weeks already now is to write a story on, um, on shifting uh, our menus into this flexitarian uh, uh, type of eating based on Mediterranean and Asian cuisines. Mm -hmm. We don't mm -hmm. forget for thousands of years, meat was always a luxury. You, know? mm -hmm. I mean, you, go, you, right. go, to, you go to the uh, uh, medieval cuisines of Europe, for example, uh, it was potatoes and bread. You know? um, and 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 uh, porridge you know i mean for breakfast you had porridge 
here it was invented by accident because someone left their porridge sitting there overnight <laughs> and it tasted better the next morning. So, but that's that that's what's really so grains in forms of porridge and bread and 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 potatoes and um, so meat. Typically, the village would slaughter an animal once a month or so, and the entire village uh, participated. It got distributed because meat wasn't it couldn't last at that time. No, and, and so anyway, um, meat meat was never center plate in in the in the historic cuisines. Um, you know, so so what happened in the in the new world is that you had an abundance of wildlife, millions of buffaloes and you know wildlife everywhere. So meat was uh, the most available uh, the, the thing uh, uh, to eat. And it took time for farmers to establish themselves and start you know, growing vegetables and, and grains and so on. And so it's sort of sort of a historic anomaly that uh, in the in the new world diet so that they are so meat centric. Yeah. Um, so, so anyway, in order to change my, my, my mind is going, why don't you create like one day a week, like the idea of meatless Monday was big mm -hmm. for a while. And then it sort of got wiped out, but, but call it like plant power day or something of that sort. Right. Um, because two things need to happen. First of all, the consumer needs to try stuff they wouldn't normally eat, but nowadays, okay, on Monday, I'm going to try something new. And the the catering industry, you know, both the uh, processed food industry and the restaurant industry need to experiment with what they can produce uh, profitably um, and within their skill sets and, uh, and, and test what customers end up liking, right? So you have one day where you can plan and, and, and play with stuff and develop the, a portfolio of recipes uh, that actually f play in this in this uh, context. And then you roll it out. So maybe if you find something that just really uh, works really well on a Monday, okay, let's just put it on the menu and feature it now. So because for the, the, um, the um, American food system, you have an enormous challenge to train up talent. Um, you know, because there is no real formal uh, culinary development here like you have in Europe. Um, and and uh, at the same time, the entire supply chain has to adjust itself, you know, the, the, the production kitchens and so on. But you need, you know, you need to create a philosophical understanding, you know, where, where everybody gets it. Yeah, we need to get out of you know, eating so much meat, but how do we do this? I don't want to, you know, uh, suffer in the process here. I want this to be fun. You know, I want this to be something I like doing. And, and so make this playful and and uh, and uh, and interesting. So that's sort of mm -hmm. where, I, where I'm going with this. So maybe a piece of your activity ought to be playful and interesting, meaning um, getting together with chefs, getting together with uh, communities that are doing dinners, you know, for shared dinners in the street, you know, pull out tables and and go share food, whatever whatever it might be. But if, but if you had some practices like that, that would get people to start shifting behavior and, and connect over food and shifting their diet, that would be really useful. Yeah. Cool. Uh, um, so Go ahead. I, as I'm listening to you guys, I'm I'm realizing that we're kind of all over the place because we're we're trying to change minds, we're trying to change habits, we're trying to change systems, we're trying to like it's like this. We're I, it feels like we're conflating some of the fundamentals with some of the objectives and mm -hmm. well if if we think of i'm just going to use the word understanding which which klaus just used uh, if we say okay what what this project about the 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 initial thing this project is it's about understanding there are things that we can do with understanding. We can change people's minds and we can 
you know, change people's patterns and habits and this is and that's is and the others, but but that the the that the it's a tool that can do that. But what we're building is this tool. This tool for understanding, for collective understanding. And how that tool can get used later is obviously important. I mean, it's the reason for building this, but it isn't what we're building. That what we're building is simply an understanding tool. And, and that might reduce both the complexity and the, um, the conversation down to, we're talking about an understanding tool and that it has a beginning and an end and it's limited and how you then use that tool in what environments, what contexts, and what, with what information, that's secondary to the basics of the tool. Because I don't see us being able to like keep thinking of neo books as the here's the the knowledge, here's the idea, here's the thing, all the way to here's people's minds being changed. Because the that's how that tool gets end up ends up getting used. And so we're I'm wondering if we can or should bring the scope of what this project is about back to limiting it as a tool that we collectively can use and others can use to uh, to meet our goals, our ends, which are all consistent in our case. Uh, but I, I think there is a there's a boundary somewhere that we're missing. Um, let me take a swing at what you just said, and then anybody else who wants to jump in as well, please. But so people write books because they want to convince people of stuff, right? So a a, a book, traditional book, old fashioned dead tree book, is meant to be. Many of them are written to convince people of something, right? It's meant to disseminate something that hopefully will convince people of something. That's but fine. it's but, it's but disseminating it's, it's, information. But that's what direct, the book is does. It could, in fact, be just telling a big story. It could, there right. could be no. We just, we just said that you know the story about the man and his horse. It ha probably has no basis in fact. It's just an invented story. It's a parable, uh, whatever. But it's also used to convince people of something, of change, shifting their attitude about something. But I'm saying, the writing of a book is done to convince people stuff. Not now, necessarily. The act of, not, not all books are by any means. By any means, but a bunch of people write books. Klaus is writing nuggets to try to convince people to shift how they farm, how they eat, how their food system plays a role in our lives. No doubt about it. So I don't know where the break is between the convincing act there. And then the second thing is a really big piece, a piece that Rick keeps coming back to that I really like is that, hey, this is a verb, not a noun. Who gives a shit about the book? This is about the conversations and the act of comparing notes and making the nuggets better and whatever else which is the act of being convinced about something. It, it, when, when you change your mind and you agree to something and you make a collective change to a, a piece of, of information or a piece of the story, you've been convinced and you've shifted your perspective on it. So for me, the, the convincing part, we don't need to parse it out. It's just, a, it's just a natural part of interaction in a healthy neo book community of communities. Should but we I ever get to that point? But I think... I don't know how to parse it out is what I'm saying. Yeah, right. But let me try. You and I, or the four of us, sitting down and saying, here's, here's a claim. Let's look at this claim. Do you think this is true? What's backing it up? Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. All right, we agreed on this. If each of us did not have a position on that claim prior to our conversation, we will have changed each other's minds in the process. Or maybe we had a different position, uh, but we've changed each other's minds. So I agree with you that the process of this doing of operating this tool changes the producer, the, the collaborators' minds. That I agree with. 
but it isn't necessarily what we're using the tool for to change other people's minds. That, that the use of it after the fact, like the four of us agree on something, whatever that claim was. And we're like, yep, this is the claim. And then we go, hey, I'm going to publicize this claim. I'm going to use it in my presentation. I'm going to use it in my this and that. I'm going to use it in my uh, article that I'm writing uh, on LinkedIn. That is separate from what I'm calling the tool of understanding. That the tool of understanding is to, to help bring together understanding in a, in a collective way, a way that we can work with each other on, a way that is clear and simple and straightforward. But then we take that and we go, look, our community is saying this. We've all agreed on this. Everybody's talking about this, blah, 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 blah. And here, let me put it into this public space. Not that our claims aren't public, but a public space that I'm choosing to, to make um, an effort in. As Klaus was describing, he wants to change people's minds. So he then takes that, that nugget, that claim, and he says, hey, let's do meatless Mondays. I can't remember what else you proposed it was going to be called. Um, <laughs> Plant-powered potential. I don't know. Because meatless, the moment you say meatless, you know, you have... Uh, oh, yeah, you're, you're focusing on the negative rather than yeah. the positive, right? Right, right. The, the, <clears> first <throat> thing, the first thing they teach you in marketing, focus on the positive. Um, so, so how do you... How do we draw that line where the doing it in, in our efforts, whatever our work happens to be, right, um, is separate from the tool. So we encapsulate it at that point of where the nugget is, is done. It's being agreed to or disagreed to, utilized by people, but, but that's where the line ends. Austin, Rick, do you see the line? I'd like to go back before understanding, and I put that in the chat, um, which is getting into the issue of inquiry and inquiry skills, curiosity skills, exploration, uh, discovery skills. And I think those precede uh, mutual understanding. Um, and when you have, you know, what Klaus is dealing with, by the way, I shared a little, I don't know if you've heard of that uh, podcast series called Eat, Eat for the Planet or not, but I, I remember following it a number of years ago, and um, I was very impressed with him. And, you know, he was just one person, you know, with a group of people doing it. But the question is, what can you learn from all these movements that are trying to shift dietary habits away from meat for all the obvious reasons? Um, and, um, you know, why is it that we can't create a critical mass to be able to do that? And for the very reason that Joe Rogan and other, uh, you know, carnivores who will die off younger and along with their paradigms, hopefully, <laughs> um, you know, earlier, um, you know, how do you shift that? And, and if you have people who have been so rigidly schooled in a particular way of thinking and they haven't even been given opportunities to understand what it means to make inquiries from an open mindset and even understand what an open mindset means or experience it, then it's very difficult to create uh, adaptive agile learning systems or complex adaptive systems, whatever you want to call them. Um, so this is where I, I come back to the issue of, of, of what I see the focus of Neo books is about creating collaborative and transformational learning experiences. Um, and I don't want to convince anybody of anything. Um, I don't, I mean, interesting enough, I was in a conversation, somebody sent, got mad with me about something I wrote. And he says, well, doctors teach all the time. I says, actually, teaching doesn't work very well. <laughs> you know, and I said, I said, I don't teach any, I try and minimize the teach. Sometimes, you know, you just need to learn and they want that. And that's all they need. Bingo. Vast majority of the time, they don't want to be taught. And so the question then becomes, well, how can you make them curious to become learners of how to improve their own health. 
And that's a paradigm shift, complete and utterly. And as an aside, this one guy who is um, Arabic, who who went to uh, Mecca and walked around three times, came back. And, you know, I just planted the seeds with this guy. And this guy just, you know, he inspired himself. I just provided the space for something to, you know, to fertilize. And this guy completely got off all his medications over about six months. It was mind blowing. And he was praising me. And I says, no, you did it all. I just provided the fertile ground for you to decide you want to make the change. That's it. So the com coming back to the metaphors um, again, well, how do you create fertile ground where people can have an open minded spirit of inquiry and how can we cultivate that? And then people may loosen up a little bit the rigidity that people regress to with their fundamentalist thinking on particular issues because they get emotionally triggered. If you can't, you know, that's where nuggets can just trigger the reflexes stronger and they just get become even more emotionally reactant. So um, how can you create a space where people can lower their emotional reactivity to self-reflect about their mindsets? So anyway... Can you, Rick, can you give a little bit more detail about what you, um, what sort of questions or provocations you gave your patient that led him to? You know, I, I honestly, I, I can give you general ones. I can't remember specifically for him, actually. Um, um, you know, one, actually, I, I, you know, we talk in, in, in medicine, well, it, it comes from a psychology. They talk about motivational interviewing. And I was, I went to the very first international conference back in 1993 or two or whatever. Hmm. Steve Rolnick and um, uh, Miller, they wrote the mm -hmm. book of motivation to do. And I, I really got into, I wrote a book about it, about how to apply and find the care, yada, yada. And then I came to realize that, you know, motivation is hard work. You got to lower your resistance. You got to motivate people. It's hard work, you know? So I was, a while back, I was talking with a colleague of mine who's very familiar with this. He said, we need inspirational therapy. We don't need motivation. If you're inspired, you will find the motivation to get there. So how do you get into an inspirational framework? Um, and the, the same friend of mine shared me something on hidden brain, which I thought was absolutely brilliant. And I used a variant of it, but the second part I hadn't. And I invite people to say, well, you know, paint a vision of what you would like your health to be, you know, two, three, four, whatever time down the road, what you'd like to be, 20 pounds lighter, yada, yada, yada. And then write a story to your future self about what you want your health to be. So I've used that technique before. But the interesting one, the twist on this that has research in, to support it, which is more powerful, is that you imagine yourself going to your future self, and then you write a letter back to your former self on a, on a, on a back sheet of paper, on two sides of one sheet of paper. And... You know, I mean, I don't know exactly what's working, but it's creating the environment where people become more inquisitive about themselves, reflect about themselves. And that's a very different um, different tact. Um, and I, I'm finding that people really enjoy that. You know, when I say, you know, motivation is hard work. What if you got inspired? What would that do for you? And then they say, ooh, you know. I have no idea how effective it is, but it's nice to get little anecdotal stories of small successes in the lives of people. So, you know, uh, transformational change is possible, but it's uh, how do you create the environment to do it? Thanks, Rick. That's really thought provoking um, and fits a lot of other stuff that I'm working on right now, trying to figure out how do, how do I present ideas without giving solutions well, or well you know yeah. yeah exactly what the other thing is is that your your work in trust is is you know because if you don't have the trust it doesn't happen but you have to go back from trust to say well how do you create the safe space mm -hmm. that you can enable trust to enable a little more open-mindedness so you can open little doors a little sunlight come in and will they will they open the door wider will they cross the threshold you know um you know it's it's um you know, it, 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 it's really trying to evoke people on their own ontological journey, so to speak. And, and how it, do you create the environments to do that? And it mostly only seems to really work profoundly when it comes from their motivation and they put in the energy to, to exactly. do the change. If you try exactly. to force them to, it doesn't often stick. Yeah, it triggers emotional reactions, which has the counterproductive effects. Exactly. We've all done it. We've all done it. And we've all experienced it as well. 
I'm trying to figure out how to take my body of work and run it through your filter so that I understand how to lead people toward the places that I'd like them to contemplate, but it's hard. Yeah, I, you know, I think it's, I, I'm not sure you can lead them. You, I mean, you know, for, from a Socratic point of view, you may have a sense of destiny, but at the end of the day, it's it, to me, this is where questioning is so important and having the trust and for people to come up with their own questions about themselves and what they want to do. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, if they, if they take charge of their own questioning, then, and you start opening it up and you create spaces where people see this happening with other people. Can you create these collaborative environments where people said, you know, I used to think like this and now I changed it, you know, and people start, you know, how can you create a sort of social contagion around uh, the sort of uh, space that Jose is talking about collective understanding. I mean, I think there's different frames for thinking about it, you know, mm -hmm. but, um, and sometimes what, you know, it comes back to, I spoke a couple of weeks ago about, you know, the, um, um, the Institute for General Semantics. And, and I think what can happen is that people get too married to their maps. And, and so they get, you know, it, it evokes their ego shadow and, their, and, and, you know, it's very difficult for people to let go of their frameworks. I mean, I was very much schooled in motivational engineering. I think it's fantastic. But, you know, people sometimes get a little bit too into it as the way, so to speak, when there is no one way. There's lots of ways, and some ways are better than others, and some work for other people, but not for others. So it's a question of how you can have that, uh, you know, agile frameworks or scaffolding that can adapt to different contexts, individuals, yada, yada. As a brief side note, I will say that I made a, some attempt to understand Korzybski's thinking because general semantics mm. comes from Alfred Korzybski. He also yep. created something called non-Aristotelian logic or null A. Yep. Uh, wrote a book titled The World of Null A in 1948. And another book, uh, The Sci Science and Sanity, an introduction to non-Aristotelian systems and general semantics in 33. Yep. Uh, I have a friend who knows a bunch about it, but I've not been able to make any understanding of it. I, I have not been, it has not penetrated my skull at all. I, I don't know how to make sense out of it. Like null well, A doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, I, I'm no scholar of his work. I mean, I sort of vaguely figured and I just stumbled into a meeting where I didn't realize he was the head on show of the place. Oh, cool. And, but, but, but the thing about it though, it is really, I mean, you know, you have these different schools like sense making and then you have meaning making and then you have, uh, you know, purpose making, I'd rather call it ethical purpose making. To me, those things are all interesting. And, and sometimes people get locked into one of these, you know, domains when they're all interconnected, you know, um, you know, that's, that's the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm a bit wary about, as you've already gathered, metaphorical reductionism to one metaphor. I think metaphors have upsides and downsides and it's a question of, you know, um, exploring what their their strengths and limitations are. Yep. So yep. that's meaning making. That's meaning making because you know people have a certain meaning to a metaphor. You can have the same metaphor, but it can have different meanings. And if you don't understand the slight differences of meaning, then you know you're you're losing out. You know, I was just uh, when when you were talking about uh, questioning, leading questions, the Socratic method of inquiry is very powerful to talk people out. But then as Socrates himself learned, some people take better to this than others, <laughs> you know? And uh, at the end, it didn't work out so well when he had to, uh, uh, he suffered for it. But um, I mean, some people are just in their buckets and refuse to come out you now and they just get angry uh, uh, when, when you are leading them into uh, yeah. questions yeah. that challenge yeah. their assumptions. You know? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, where I might, I would say they're, they're, di they're directional questions that point out dilemmas rather than leading questions, because to me, leading questions has a, has a certain sort of, but, Amy, you know, if you're using a Socratic method, you do have a sense of where things might, like, could go, but you don't know the journey and how can you create questions that enable, you know, it's like a Sherpa, you know, you're, you're a Sherpa, you, you want to get to the top of the mountain, and there's probably different ways and better ways of doing it. Um, but even Sherpas have a certain limitations uh, as a metaphor for facilitating change. So that's why I like using a blend of metaphors. I mean, I think blend of metaphors actually can help shake up people's thinking to create new ideas. So, um, so how can we do that more effectively? Maybe you can 
bottle that and sell it as a beverage, the blended metaphor. <laughs> in little, yeah, little, little, little tetra packs, you know, on your grocery yeah, well, shelves. Well, a, a, actually, I call it a, a blended metaphors of fruit and vegetables. There you are. You can go market that one, Klaus, okay? <laughs> as, as, a, as a smoothie drink, you know? That'd be great. Uh, no meat products involved. <laughs> But my point uh, just got expressed very clearly. <laughs> How so? What was about the separation that we were talking about earlier? Yeah. So we just we we've just gone and sort of described the whole process of um, how we convince other people of things or how we come to uh, learning things and all of that kind of stuff and. And I agree with all that, but is that is that what the tool, assuming we call it a tool, NeoBooks is, right? Because if it is all of that, then, then we're sort of just trying to put everything in, into this same bucket. And I'm trying you know, through this mm -hmm. questioning to say, what if we just narrow this thing to a tool that's manageable, that isn't everything, that is just something? And what if we define that something and, and encapsulate it and say, this is what this tool is. And all those other things are true we have to think about how we get to use the tool, as as uh, was just mentioned by Rick. And then we have to think about how we use that tool. So we have to sort of figure out what it is that we, when we're engaging with people, what's the questions we need to ask? How do we get to the correct questions? Okay, great. Let's use this tool in order to do that. And then once we say, okay, we've used the tool, now we have a result. Now let's go figure out how we go and deploy this tool. But I think if if both what Rick just described and what Klaus just described earlier are also part of this tool, then it's it has it, it's going to be really difficult for us to bound it in a way that allows us to move forward. I'm so one way my brain is hearing what you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong, goes right back to Rick asking us, is, is Neo book a noun or a verb? And it feels to me like you're, you're asking us to noun Neo books and to say, here's the thing called a Neo book and here are its boundaries. And the verbing of it is a different activity altogether and we should not worry about it so much. And for me, the verbing part of Neo books is what causes the design of Neo book, the noun to actually even happen. For the verbing part of what we're doing, the all the activities around what we hope happens with neo book objects, um, all of all of that is where the change happens, unfortunately, and what's going to shape the tools. Because we, if we pick crappy tools by by deciding to only focus on the tools, I don't, I don't, I still don't know how to separate the activity we want, which is not the simple matter of publishing a nugget into a stream called the presentation or called the book. That's not, that defeats the purpose of the NeoBooks project if all we want to do is publish an artifact. Um, so I, I don't know how to disengage them still. Am, am I misunderstanding again? I think so. Uh, I think that the, I'm not suggesting we make NeoBooks, the concept of NeoBooks. To me, the NeoBook is a concept. It's not a, not a thing. So I would agree with you. It's this mm -hmm. bigger picture concept. The process of arriving at a uh, at a nugget, use your terminology, what I would say, an understanding. So that thing, if we think of it as a tool, that process, that, that it is a process of arriving at 
creating an understanding and arriving at some understanding and that we can collectively participate at arriving in that understanding. Can I, can I inquire within right there? Because I'm, I'm unclear that an understanding is the result or is ever even actually very possible. Like even when we think we're understanding each other, what we really have is a crossing and intersection of several different narratives and sets of facts or ideas where we're more or less in agreement. We're not really necessarily understanding because I don't know how you meant everything that you just said, and I never will. But I could, I could say, what I think I understand of what you said, I'm willing to agree with, and that sounds great. Let's move on using that as a, a foundation for what we're going to do together. So making the understanding the core nugget feels dangerous to me because I'm not sure we ever get to a real understanding. What we get to is a crossing of narratives and belief systems that feels more or less accurate or dangerous, right? And then what I'm interested in is, is the, a place where we can juxtapose those narratives so that we can, and, and ask the kinds of questions that Rick is asking of people and let them mingle in a space where they can discover facts or contradictions or whatever else. And so for me, that would be the understanding, sorry, Rick, uh, for me, that would be um, that understanding is the objective, not that we necessarily arrive at it and that that getting closer to that understanding so that there is a more common sense of what is the thing that in this context, in this specific is, about is beneficial cooperation as the objective where understanding is this asymptotic never quite there thing that happens along the way but really what we want is people to cooperate better toward positive goals or they uh, slightly longer than uh understanding, understanding. But, okay. but but their but their degree of understanding may not be huge may not they may not get to understanding because for me i think very few people actually ever really understand each other I think we think we do, and we it's good enough for government work, and then we move on from there and do stuff together, right? I was re just reading a, a profile of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in the Times a couple of days ago, and they're talking about how she crosses the aisle all the time to work with her enemies on stuff that they have in common. And she just does that over and over and over. She's a good example of bipartisan work, believe it or not. Um, I guess and she she's understands doing... what, they, what they like and don't like. Because she knows that they can reach an understanding, which I think is mm -hmm. different from understanding. Wow. Which is, I, I hadn't thought about that before, but, but an understanding is, you know, you and I agree to disagree, but we have common cause in this thing. Let's go make this thing happen. Doesn't mean we both understand each other's points of view. Exactly. I hadn't thought about that distinction. Go ahead, Klaus. I, uh, I had my 45th uh, uh, anniversary yesterday um congratulations thank you thank Yay. you <laughs> and uh my son and his wife called and they wanted to have engage us in this conversation i mean how did we manage this right and uh so it reminds me what jerry is saying gaining common understanding yeah 45 years in i'm still struggling you know it's just uh... <laughs> <laughs> i i hope she's not in the room no she's not there <laughs> <laughs> She might agree with you really well, though. Yeah, probably. Really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, but the, well, go ahead, Rick. I think what it speaks to is that there, there's varying degrees of transientness or grounding of middle ground. It's sometimes a little bit nebulous. It's there fleeting, and you can, you know, find a little middle ground to move on, as you were saying, uh, Jose. Uh, whereas I think there are middle grounds where people can feel pretty strongly about. Uh, that they do firmly have their feet on this middle ground. So it's this sort of continuum. Uh, the, the thing that you reminded me of, Jose, was a conference I went to I mean, about 15 years ago. I don't even remember why I went, but I wanted to go to an unconference. It was in Paris, and it was on, uh, it, the, it was on, it was, the conference name was Explain, and it was all about explaining. Because what's you know the the outcome of understanding it helps you to explain things in a way that you can take action. 
So, at the, it, you know, I'm always wary when, when we get focused on just one thing. And, and I know you're not doing that, but, you know, the next step is, well, how do we explain things? And we may explain things differently, even when we think we have a shared understanding. And then it creates some difficulties about how we work together, you know. But I want to come back to the issue of, of uh, something that I, I shared in that blog post, which was I was triggered this morning by um, – a, a, a LinkedIn article, and it, it, it sort of made me think about, a little bit more clearly about the issue between the relationship between meta crisis and the uh, the poly crisis. The the meta crisis is the sort of systemic power abuse dynamics that go on that set up our poly crisis of complex wicked problems. It's all in that article actually, and this person was had this lovely little diagram showing uh, lots of little arrows in the shape of an arrow. Um, and the hours was going in the opposite direction, but the other hours were, uh, arrows were going in the other direction, if you can visualize it. But it was a very interesting visual, a linear visual framework, which I felt missed the point. Uh, and that's why it inspired me to, the visual triggered me to say, that's not quite right. Um, and so I, I, it gave me more ideas about how to articulate in that particular blog post. But I want to come, the, the, the relevance of what I'm talking about here is, is to what extent are we actually um, really looking at more of a meta level of, of thinking that has generalizable to, to the, the, the poly crisis of wicked problems? And I think it's, it's a question of how can we create our you know, metacognition, our meta thinking, um, our, our meta understanding explaining, because I think that is a higher level of thinking about from what that can be generalized into different contexts across different domains. And that's why I'm interested in equity meta governance because it's an overarching framework to deal with regenerative economics, whatever, whatever it is. And we haven't got that framework. And that's why I'm interested in this, you know, expanded notion of what, what does equity meta governance even mean? And how would you co-create it in such a way that we could just get along? Wouldn't it be nice if we could just get along? Well, anyway, this is the challenge that we started uh, uh, talking about, and right? we started out talking about connecting a, a meta uh, uh, understanding, meta level understanding, with the various uh, knockouts right, that are that are operating underneath this meta frame, and for as long as the meta level thinking is disconnected from the from the base then you're dealing with these conflicting objectives and this is the mess that we have right because we are because our political system is not conducive to developing a meta level plan because invariably uh it disadvantages uh, uh a status quo player you now and and so you have this inertia uh, that uh that that prevents the the formulation of a of a plan uh, because invariably they're winners and losers. I mean, how are you going to tell Cargill uh, they have to change their business model significantly, which puts their entire empire at risk? Now, and, and why would they not do this unless they're forced to do it? Um, but if they were forced to do it, they would come, probably come up with some really cool stuff. You know? but, but why would they run this risk and, and uh, invest money into something? So, so that's really the... the how how to get to a meta level understanding, you know, that then governs how people filter stuff that they see at the ground level. This doesn't fit the big picture, right? Eating more meat's not a great idea because all the implications of it. You know, it's just sort of a reflexive understanding of of meta level perspectives, and and. In a in a better world, our media would be all over this to inform and educate the public. You know, but they're doing anything but because you know, their revenue streams depend on status quo uh, uh, interests, eyeballs and advertising revenues. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Which undermines everything, and that's why it's so difficult to do this work. I may have to. I'm just going to contact a friend because I have to. A friend of mine is giving a plenary time. session at a at a conference, and I haven't. We, we wrote a paper together thirty years ago, and I thought, oh, I want to. My friend is at the conference. So I said, FaceTime the, the plenary session. So I'm going to see if I can catch it. I might be back Great. if it doesn't work. All right. All right. Okay. Thanks, Rick. Take care. Okay. Right. Bye now.
Um, one small observation, Jose, relative to the tools that we're looking at um, is that I keep thinking of the tool set as temporary, as this is the tool set of the moment and the slightly awkward combination of Obsidian plus GitHub is just what works right now to solve some of our problems. And if we went to Fission or some distributed database or the ones you've Fireworks, Firecamp, I'm forgetting what the Firecracker, Fireproof. whatever, <laughs> Fireproof, thank you, or something else, that would just be a swap out of the tool suite, but that the tool suite is less interesting and important than the process in the community. I'm, I wasn't talking to those tools. Okay. I was talking to this as a tool. This process as a tool? Yeah. But then you're talking about the process, about the verb. Yes. The, 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 the thing that we want to do, mm -hmm. think of it as a tool. What does it accomplish? What, what's the starting state of, that this tool takes things at? And what's the end state that this tool takes things at? And let's define that and let's stick to that. There's a lot of stuff that happens before. There's a lot of stuff that happens after. But let's define that and limit ourselves to that so that what we develop, what we create, what we produce is this bounded thing. I like to think of it as a tool because it helps me understand what does this tool act on and how does it transform what that thing is into something else so that it then has purpose and use after. So what, what's, what's the transformation right. or, the, or the, the utility that this tool provides us? So I will, I will note for the record that I was misunderstanding you earlier through this whole conversation, maybe before, in that, as you said, the tool, I was thinking mostly software and platform. And I don't, you didn't mean that at all. You meant this process as an instrument for whatever reason. And then second thought is, which points me back to our conversation about understanding, like do we ever really understand each other? Uh, and then the second thought is maybe the, the end point is better decisions. And I think that's a limiting phrase. It's, it's not a great phrase, but it's an easy phrase. It's a memorable phrase because understanding has the complexities I was just talking about a moment ago that can we make better decisions together? That'd be cool. So is what the tool does make better decisions? Well, the tool doesn't, but the process does. Okay. So, but is the process of the tool so I, I'm thinking of the of the the tool as like it's not the dishwasher by itself because right. the dishwasher by itself does nothing. Right. Right. I've got to load it. I've got to hit the start button, and it does the thing because it has water because blood because because sorry. Right. So so I'm thinking that let's use the 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 dishwasher as the example. We have to provide it with power, with water. We have to uh, put, the, you know, the dishes in and the soap. And all of that is what we need to understand that fits inside of that box that is the dishwasher. In our case, some of those things are things that we're talking about that Rick mentioned. How do we ask the questions? What are the questions we need to ask? What's the, 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 the that's the processing of the soap, that's the processing of the water, that's the making of electricity. It happens, it's important, it's necessary, but it's not what we do with this tool. Maybe, maybe not, whatever it mm -hmm. is, right? And then there's this stuff that we do that is we eat with the dishes, we cook with the dishes, we serve people with the dishes, we do all this wonderful stuff with the dishes, and we there's good utility with all these wonderful dishes. But that's not what we do. We wash them. We get them nice and clean, spotless, beautifully shiny, and that's what we do. So just using a metaphor, <laughs> which, Rick, mm -hmm. which Rick loves, but 
but to me, if we don't bound this dishwashing process, then we are always conflating the stuff that needs to happen before and the stuff that needs to happen after as the thing. Right. And, I, and, and I'm afraid that part of what we do is the making of the food and the growing of the crop, as well as the washing of the dish. So, and I don't know. Uh, and partly I'm thinking that the, the questions that Rick was asking and his very nice story about one of his patients, you know, provoke asking provocative questions about, hey, what do you what do you hope your life looks like in 20 years and write yourself a letter in the present from that future self? That's a, that's great. And that's Wonderful. that's not but that's not the making of the soap. That that's actually a part of the process. And, and that's a it's a very evolved part of the process that said that that has, I think, as it's working assumptions, <laughs> gosh, if I just present this person with a couple of facts, they're never going to change their mind. I need to cause them to find some some internal motivation to want to make this change. I think that's great. But is the Neo book or is the nugget right. the thing that is going to actually ask that question or tell that story to the patient? Why not? Of course. Is so it, that question, that, that question. Is, is the, the process of the Neo book, the yeah. process of the Neo book, the nugget, yeah. actually the thing that's asking that question? Or let me give you another option. Is that question something that could either inform the questions we're playing with in the Neo book nugget or inform what that Neo book nugget is going to be used for, but not the actual thing of asking that question so or posing that question? Last week or the week before, we talked about GPTs, and we went into it in some considerable depth. And we also asked the more philosophical question as of, are GPTs just going to obsolete books and all that? But GPTs would basically give you conversational access to a body of work, and potentially a garden of nuggets or something like that. Um, so if you're in conversation with a GPT, and that's the means of access, then I think, yeah, I think, I think at that level, very much. The process so, of asking so questions you, is, in fact, part of the tool. So to you, what we're talking about here in the form of neobooks is not a tool for content producers. It's actually a tent from consumers, content for consumers. I hate the words content and consumer. So you're you're asking me a troubling question. Okay, uh, I've spent the last Is thirty it's... years. I've, I've spent the last thirty years trying to fight the word consumer. Okay, general public. Yeah. And you can call them muggles, by the way, which is a funny way of talking about civilians. I'm I'm totally happy talking about an ordinary okay. people as muggles. But, but you understand my point. I think the, I do the, the distinction. Point. Yeah. Um, can you ask? Go ahead, Klaus. Yeah, I, I think the this process of interacting with the GPT uh, is somewhat serendipitous, also, you know, because you're asking a question or you are you are developing a topic, and you invariably end up in places that you didn't anticipate or that you that you haven't thought of. So, so there's that uh, component, um, but you have to go in to the discussion with looking for a certain outcome, right? So, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I always start a conversation with the GPT by explaining a thought process I just have uh, and, and uh, um, a, a problem or a question that is puzzling me. Um, and then I throw that out and asking, please summarize, you know, what my thoughts are so far and uh, and add to it. And so then I get like a first response. So the conversation is uh, interactive, right? Um, and uh, uh, I, but, but it is also highly constrained to where I want to go. I mean, the GPT is really, um, uh, you, you, you're really directing the GPT's direction. I mean, the, the, uh, the, the direction of the GPT, right? So you, you have to have a preconceived idea what it is that you like to that you like to ponder, if that makes sense. Yeah. So um, 
so, so I'm not sure how that how that falls into what you were saying, but um, I, it's it's a it's basically an enhancement of your own thought process, right? So so you and and by enhancing and guiding your thought process, it expands it, and it puts you into into uh, uh, spheres that you may may not have reached on your own. I I struggle with the question of if what we're talking about is that the re end result is a an AI interface that is general public facing, then then the general public facing interface has has to have a way for us people who are creating these things that the general public interface is going to use as material to speak to to the general public then then we we still have to build that piece we still have to get that information into some model and still to do that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's that's what how that's how I was using uh my neo book and still use it because I'm expanding volume two. I mean the whole the whole thing is that uh, in the conversations uh that we're developing and as new topics occur to me, which is an iterative process, you know, I discuss that and I create another nugget. Now that information is anchored in the GPT. I got a note from uh, AI, from the open AI, I think about a few weeks back, where they were saying that they now have made active the entire library of my discussions. So that, that means the, 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 the GPT uh, maintains a record of, uh, of every one of uh, you know, my, my interactions. So, and it, and it and it 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 is you no know, that you're framing it. You're really putting it into a box within which you like to to communicate. Right? That that's that's your uh, discussion tool. Um, and so yeah. So I mean, we haven't. I haven't tried yet to make that accessible to an outsider um, or, or to to you know, someone just playing with it. And I don't know what would come back. To be very honest, yet, but. Uh, so I that's have kind of, that's kind of a longer term goal, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I, th I think there's a, a big difference between um the disseminating nuggets and um building nuggets and 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 curating nuggets. Um I don't think that the average general public is going to be um, participating in the curation of nuggets. And but you never know who's going to create a nugget. So I don't see that there's well, like a, a priesthood of nugget makers, and then the no, 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 I'm not. I'm not. I'm not saying that there's a priesthood of that. I, I'm just saying that the average person doesn't write a book, and the average person uh, does fine. isn't the average going person to... doesn't contribute to Wikipedia but uses it all the time. Right. Sounds That's fine. my point. That's yeah. my point. You but can't you, put you're... a gate on who gets to edit what page on the Wikipedia because that fucks up the whole system. Totally agree. But what I'm saying is, I think there is, and and I maybe ideologically we have a very big difference in the way we're thinking about this. Uh, it, it's starting to sound like maybe there is. To me, the focus on the nuggets was for having a way to build and create nuggets. And that that was the primary focus. The, the, the fact that Part of what I'm hearing now is that 
that piece of it and say a, a, a conversational AI that that taps it is is also that's one in the same that those are the same thing that 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 the, the, there isn't a gap between that interface or another interface or another interface or any one of hundreds of interfaces that potentially could consume nuggets. Hmm. I'm, I'm just asking, I was just reaching out to Pete uh, and I hope he he uh, takes, takes me up. It's actually a commercial project. Um, I want to create um, an interface um, for general use on people um, engaging in nutrition, nutrition for cancer patients, nutrition for um, diabetes, nutrition for you know, uh, uh, overweight and things like this. So you, so to create an, an interface, and I've created a, a GPT that's loaded with every cookbook in the world, <laughs> with uh, um, medical research on cancers and on diabetes. So, so it it, uh, it it has all the libraries in in it, uh, and it's amazing how uh, its interactiveness actually you can ask it how should I program this, and it will tell you. So it actually tells you what it needs to be to be further advanced and programmed. So, so my daughter is going to do it um, now. She uh, uh, because she had you know, a cancer experience. She's a cancer survivor and all this. So we would really like. Uh, to, to find a way where a, a, a muggle uh, can go and say, you know, I just got diagnosed with cancer um, and here's my diagnosis and here's what the doctor wants to do. You know, how should I uh, change my dietary practices and how do I, what should I, what do I need to do, you know, to get healthy again? And then you have uh, now a, a body, right? A person, a personal coach who is now talking you through uh, what to do, and I think that would be just a super powerful uh, way to use uh, a, a GPT for good purposes. Um, we're getting close to the end of our, our time here. Uh, we'll say from the beginning, the book part of NeoBook was bait to lure people into a conversation around community and thinking together. So mm -hmm. I don't, I don't think there's anything new or stunning about the fact that. The outcomes are really people collaborating and getting to changing their minds about something. I think that's that's a really important outcome. It's like people finding a way to discuss, compare notes, debate, argue, whatever it might be, but have fair fights um, in in order to not only make a better decision, but leave behind a little rabbit trail of some sort or pheromone trail of some sort that improves the general environment so that other people trying to go down exactly the same path don't have to replicate everything they did, but can sort of build on it, which is this idea that the nuggets get better over time. And and um, who do you think is doing that? Like what what I think there's a few people who care a lot about it. It's just like Wikipedia's dynamics. There's a couple of people who care about chemistry and they monitor like hawks any changes to any page that has to do with chemistry in Wikipedia. And they will be on a change in a second. They don't give a shit about the French part of Wikipedia or whatever else. They're, they're solely focused on the topic that has passion for them. Similarly here, people will, some people will use, I think, this environment just to publish their memoirs and their point of view about stuff. And they almost won't care whether anybody interacts with it. They probably won't pick up anybody else's ideas because it's all about the thing that's only in their head. And if they do that, and, and some of those nuggets happen to be valuable and found by other people and then shined up and put into larger contexts, I'm good. That, and it, it's not that that person had to have in mind the collaboration. The collaboration could happen posthumously. It's like, hey, I, I just I just found Judy's you know nugget garden, and there's some really fabulous ideas that she wrote for nobody in particular, like like Emily Dickinson writing poetry. She wasn't writing poetry to get famous and be published. She's just writing poetry, right? So I don't care the motivation of the people. I want these things to be findable, composable, metadata taggable so that we can get the results that you're looking for and that other people are looking for that I can't even predict right now. And so that we can feed some subsets or the whole thing into the maw of GPTs and other new AIs so that they can help us through this journey as well. And one, one piece of research that's really fascinating is that it turns out that GPTs are better at convincing people to change their mind than humans are. Mm -hmm. 
That that's very, very, very interesting to me. Because it could be that getting humans out of the loop a little bit or having a, a GPT assistant or something like that might really lead to a lot more compromise and understandings rather than and I and I'm not a fan of getting to an academic final understanding over anything. And I, as I said earlier here, I don't think those are actually very possible. I think they're unlikely and in, infrequent. I, we, I we, agree with that, but but uh, we make yeah. do. We make do, but we make do, and then we we either get into terrible fights and have like civilizational conflict, or we make do and we like sort things out together and get to know each other and like each other. And even though I don't think I agree with everything you say, we have a great time together, so we do more. That's the world I want. And all of that is very neo booky to me, just because the way the the spirit in which people participate and the artifacts they leave behind are meant to be designed for that outcome. And I'm not even sure what that means from a software design perspective, but I know some of what it means from a process design perspective. So when I, I've done six startups and whenever I've done one, I've made the mistake of starting with this huge idea, this big picture. It's like, I'm going to change the world. Right. And then it's like, okay, that didn't work. And that didn't work. And that didn't work. Okay. Oh, okay. This is the thing that I can do. This is the thing that I can piece together. This is the thing that I can build. And it's a thing or a process or, you know, a service that I can offer. But it's it's bounded. Um, and the older I got, the more I did, the, the bigger the ideas and the smaller the action. I've, yeah, I'm going to have to, I have to go as well. And so my recommendation here is how do we limit the, the scope of the thing that we have to do? That this is the important part that I'm trying to say. All right. of that other stuff, all of the stuff Rick's talking about, all the stuff that Klaus is talking about is stuff we collectively want to do. I agree with that. But for this project, the project meaning the tool, right? How do we limit this tool to something that is that has a beginning, has an end, and we know what it's supposed to be doing in the middle? Because if every time we talk about it and every time we scope it, it's soup to nuts, then then we're unable to grab a hold of it and get it done. Um, okay, as quickly as I can. I don't think of this project as a startup. And I think thinking of it as a startup is probably a mistake because this doesn't have VC funding. There's no exit strategy. This is this is a thing like Tim Berners-Lee's vision of the web where he didn't start a startup. He didn't go get funding. He said, hey, here's some protocols. And then the internet was born before the web. So let's build some protocols. And so, and so, yes. So I'm, uh, so I'm on with that. Now, the MVP of the process or the tool set or whatever we want to call it is a thing that we could actually fabricate. We could actually create a couple of use cases. But those use cases could be really quite finite because we just want an MVP. And and here I'm using startup speak, startup culture speak, which is fine because an MVP basically is here's the thing we're going to build right now as a starting point because it will teach us what we need to you know, add, enhance, whatever. But for me, the bigger vision of the thing is pretty large and limitless. And I'm kind of trying to Tom Sawyer this thing because there's a lot of people seeing different parts of this vision who are already working on the piece parts. I had an early conversation with Danny Hillis at his new Knowledge Foundation. I'm forgetting exactly what it's called. It's in my brain. But it turns out that he sold the Knowledge Graph to Google, which, un which against his wishes made it private. So the knowledge graph that exists inside of Google is his invention with a company called MetaWeb. Um, then he was like, well, shit, I want to make this public. So he started this new venture with his, with his money. And they're stuck on a couple of, they're, they're stuck on some very detailed architectural elements of the uh, infrastructure, meta structure. I'm forgetting what he, what he called it. Uh, uh, but, but he's got names for these sort of three-layered model of what they're trying to build. And I'm like, I don't want to get stuck on the size and, and scope of some protocol element, I want to figure out 
How do we get protocol experts to go build something that'll fit oh, roughly here? How do we then keep up? And this might be very frustrating for you. I feel like my role is to continue to paint an impressionist portrait of the big picture and why, and then to, as much as I can, inhabit this thing and try to be the Chuck Yeager of it, to, to use it and break it wherever possible. And there isn't enough to use and break quite yet. And I don't put enough focus energy in to get that actually flywheeling at all. But I feel like what we're missing, what we try to do a lot is take a startup approach to take a bite out of it and solve that bite. And what we get then is a series of disconnected um, solutions that none of, no, no single one of which is ever particularly satisfying. You know, I don't find Miro or Mural I think I think they're both really interesting. I don't find using either of them very satisfying, right? Um, and then there's a whole bunch of tools that if I added NeoBookie capacity to them, if they talked NeoBook protocols, then this little box or this illustration inside of a mural could actually be composable and reusable in 15 other places. Now we're talking. So if we could agree on a series of protocols that uh, that we could convince other people to write to, and where we didn't have to invent the protocols even because it's way above my pay grade. Um, but we know people who know how to do that. That blend, that stew could turn into a really productive environment for making better decisions together. Does that make any sense? It does, but I, I think you're, to be honest, I think you're trying to 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 speak out of both sides. You're, you're saying there's this big picture, which is a vision that is a shared vision that we all have. Many of I us. Don't think, all... There's a lot of people working on some variant of the vision. I don't think we share the same vision at all because no. when we ask, I, if I ask three people, they have they describe it in a very different yeah. way. I, here's what I mean by that. Okay. We share an intuition that things are going to become very decentralized, very decomposable, very recomposable. That that I think is, I haven't found anybody who's been thinking about stuff that doesn't agree that that's the direction we're going. What it, what little shape it takes, right? they're looking at their little thing of their little shape and they haven't looked at somebody else's little thing of their little shape. And so, yes, I agree with you that if we compare notes, the little shape I'm looking at, little shape you're looking at, don't, don't look the same. Mm -hmm. But if we go and go meta, we go, yeah, hell yeah, that's mm -hmm. this is where we're going, right? At that scale of what the transformation is that's happening, where we're going, that's good. I think having that picture is really, really good. Mm -hmm. Understanding that an MVP thing is making a, a piece of this thing work and that it needs to have to be bounded as much as we need that big picture it needs to yeah. be bounded it needs MVPs to be are bounded and that it needs to uh, understand what it wants to do as far as what it brings in and what it spits out. So maybe we can cut through this a bit by saying we need well-defined, well-bounded MVP project descriptions and how they fit into the bigger picture while still painting the big impressionist portrait. But the MVPs are the things we can focus on and try to bring bring to completion and they should be limited. I totally agree with that. And, and so the MVP for me is, is what I was calling a project a product, mm -hmm. a tool, right. um, and and it is to to me it, it it needs to be the thing that we focus on because when we're focusing on the big picture, then it gets us all talking about all the things that need to happen before and after this tool is interjected into our into our space. Uh huh. Do you see what I'm trying to say? I think so. Like, I think so. Like Klaus has an amazing vision of what can be done to make change happen. Right. Wonderful. Rick has a, a whole bunch of questions that are really good questions about 
how do we get to a point of where we start understanding what we don't know and what we need to know, blah, 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 blah. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. But what I think this tool is doing, if we make it down to this MVP thing, has nothing to do with either of those two. It is the food that's going to get on the dish later, quite literally in the case of, of Klaus. Klaus. And it's the forethought that needs to be happening before we get to interact with the tool. Right. But that that they aren't actually the tool. And so how do we narrow this MVP to a to what we want to do is have a tool that allows us to create nuggets, to organize nuggets, to uh, engage with nuggets, to have nuggets have a life cycle, mm -hmm. and then have nuggets come out the other end available to the world to engage. Right. And and to reuse and to repurpose and to do whatever it is because these are open source nuggets. Right. They're collectively ours. They're not owned, though they can have a attribution and all of that good stuff. Bingo. Um, so to me, that's the definition we're looking for. The big picture stuff is helpful to some degree because like, okay, anybody who's thinking right now sees this world, as I say, that this is where we're going. I don't think that's super novel for people who are thinking about it. What I think is super novel is the fact that we can reduce our focus to these informational nuggets. I suggest we end this conversation right here and pick up if we can, as much as we can re reconstitute this right here next next week. Because I think I'm getting you. I'm not sure I'm getting all of you. I need to sit and stew. Um, but this is helpful. Stew away, my friend. See you next week. Thank you very much. All right. Cheers.